Hi, good morning, uh, good evening, good morning, and good afternoon to everybody, I guess, wherever you're from. Uh, thanks, Tim, for the introductory slides. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, Crane's climate modeling effort, um, which Tim alluded to. Uh, my name is Deepak Chandan, and I'm a doctoral fellow with uh, Dick Peltier, with, with whom I'm working at the University of Toronto. Um, so I'll dive right in, um, and uh, hopefully it'll be interesting to all of you. So my talk title of my talk is Climate of the Ancient Near East from the Early Holocene, which I'm going to use um, 9K as an example for, and uh, to the Mid-Holocene, uh, which I'm going to use uh, 6K. Um, so the outline of my talk, uh, is um, as follows. I'm going to begin by a brief introduction to climate modeling and then to paleoclimate modeling. And then I'm going to pivot to the paleoclimate applications to the Crane, um, crane project uh, and specifically to the 9KA um, um, early Holocene simulations and 6K early Holocene simulations. For the Crane project, our objective is to actually do a transient simulation from uh, the beginning of the Holocene to the present day hopefully capturing the many different um, um, uh, changes in, in the crane uh, interval over, over the Holocene. Uh, but in order to be able to do that, we need to first understand some very crucial um, uh, events that have taken place in the mid-Holocene. And to be able and to understand them, we are first doing time slice experiments for the early Holocene and the mid-Holocene. So I'm going to present, present results on that. Um, then I'm going to move into um, go, um, uh, our work with high resolution models, specifically for Crane's um, uh, Asian based modeling effort, which is led by Lynn uh, Welton, uh, who is the next speaker in this uh, session. And so we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about how we are going to use our global models to drive high resolution models uh, to be able to, able to provide high resolution uh, data for the um, uh, Asian based modeling effort. And then I'm going to summarize my talk. So uh, climate modeling uh, is essentially a um, application of numerical methods and computational infrastructure to um, solve the mathematical descriptions of our model, of our, of our climate, uh, of our Earth system, essentially. And to be able to solve these uh, mathematical uh, descriptions, we need to break down the Earth system into small grids, uh, into like um, squares, essentially, or you can think or uh, like a stencil on which we can apply the, uh, the numerical methods. And I'm showing you that on this figure to the right. Uh, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor. Um, if somebody could answer whether you can see my cursor or not, then I'll be... Uh, familiar with um, yes okay awesome thank you Lynn. so in this figure on the right you can see that the atmosphere um, uh, is broken up into like horizontal grids and in the vertical grid as well um, and we this is done obviously not just for the atmosphere but for the ocean as well and for the land and and, and all of these components and uh, Climate modeling is uh, actually very old. It's almost um, over 60 years old now. And back in the days, it was only just atmospheric or land modeling. But over time, over a function of time, many different components started being integrated together into what is now uh, uh, basically coupled climate models that that uh, couple all, all components of the Earth system, not just the atmosphere. So there's atmosphere, ocean, land ice. Uh, and and basically marine ecosystems and uh, and uh, aerosols and all of these things. So today's clim couple climate models are um, a long ways from the early um, climate models um, that, that started this field. So our model is a couple climate model that uh, couples atmosphere, ocean, land, ice, and sea ice. It's called the U of T version of CCSF4. And it runs on a one degree horizontal resolution, which is basically the, the standard resolution for models these days, of our global models these days. Uh, one degree approximately corresponds to 100 kilometers. So you see this is pretty coarse, um, but um, this is standard for global models. Paleoclimate modeling is basically the application of present day climate models to times in the past. And here you see, depending on which time in the past you want to model, you need to be able to change your, uh, your, your present day model to, to be able to describe that time period. Coming off from LGM to the present day, I have shown a series of snapshots of different time periods that are inter of interest to us. And you can see the world is changing constantly. 
you have um, uh, uh, lots of ice during the LGM, which is receding during the younger dryers. And by the time we come to early Holocene, which is 9Ka, you have some bits of ice left over um, northern Canada. But by the time we are in mid Holocene or present day, there is no ice over there. The world looks like this. So depending on which time period you want to model, you need to make these changes. Um, in general, um, Climate models are very tightly configured for present day, and you need to make a lot of changes, not just the orography, which I showed in the previous figure, but also bathymetry, vegetation, soils, lakes, glaciers, uh, river directions, and basically like um, solar parameters. So uh, together, these things are, are called boundary para conditions, and some of these are easier to do, and some of them are not easy to do. So many modeling groups across the world uh, do not necessarily make all the changes because some models you cannot even change these things very easily. In our model, we can, and that's what we try to be able to as uh, to reconstruct the, mod um, the results as faithfully as we can for the past. Paleoclimate modeling has long history, dating back to early, uh, early to the beginning of climate modeling. Actually, uh, it's generally a useful test for the present-day climate models because the present-day climate models are developed for the present day and they are tested against present day, and you could be overtuning them. So we obviously want to apply them to a time very different from the present day to see how they perform. It has a very active collaboration uh, with collaborative international programs, uh, such as PMIP4, which is um, an intercomparison program. And for paleoclimatology, there is a new uh, emerging frontier with uh, archaeology where uh, paleoclimate understanding is increasingly being called upon to understand uh, different um, different changes and events in, 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 in the past, such as interaction of climate with hominin evolution, the dispersal of humans out of Africa, and uh, increasingly the interaction of climate with Holocene civilizations to understand the rise and collapse, which is where, which is sort of where Crane comes in. So Crane, speaking of that, I'm going to pivot now to the Crane interval, which is essentially uh, parts of the Holocene. So let me start the stage for what the Holocene is in this time scale uh, from 32,000 years ago to zero. I'm showing you the relative, the change of relative sea level as a function of time to show how the earth descended into a glacial time period and then started coming out of the glacial time period with the sea level progressively rising. And the Holocene starts at 11.8, which is right over here. And you can see that most of the Earth had, uh, the Earth had mostly come out of the Ice Age, although in the early parts of uh, Holocene, which is shown here, the 9KA, there were still some remnant ice sheets over, over um, North America. But by the time we come to 6Ka, which I'm using as a representation for the mid Holocene, the Earth had basically reverted back to the way it looks today. So for 6Ka, we wouldn't need to make uh, any kind of uh, geographical change to our climate model. But for the 9Ka, we do need to implement uh, these, these uh, ice sheets over the northern parts of Canada. So while the Earth was changing um, in terms of um, physically because uh, the ice was receding and the Earth was coming back into how it looks today, there are also, also some other changes that were taking place in the Holocene, namely the changes to trace gases. Uh, this is CO2 here, uh, this is uh, uh, methane, and these are uh, this is N2O, which are all greenhouse gases, so they're important. Um, and at the same time, there were changes in the Earth's orbital parameters. Uh, such as the slow change in eccentricity, uh, a change in obliquity, and a change in equinox, which I'm showing you here. So uh, currently, the equinoxes uh, and uh, solstices are as, as shown here, with the winter, winter solstice appearing very close to the uh, perihelion. But as you go back in time, the solstices and equinoxes change in their position. So in, uh, in 9K, actually, the summer solstice was very close to the equinox, uh, to the perihelion. So this, this has effect um, uh, in terms of the uh, radiation that is uh, seen at the top of the atmosphere. Um, so here I'm showing you over the last 14,000 years as a function of latitude, the June 21st anomaly with respect to present day. So you can see going back to around um, 12,000 years ago or so, the insulation that was coming at the top of the atmosphere in the high latitudes was much higher than present day. And as over time, this, this, this changed to whatever it is in the present day, but it was much higher in the past. So you have a different um, uh, 
uh, structure of insulation is a function of latitude, depending on what time period you're modeling. But at the same time, you also have different uh, insulation as a function of month. So here I'm showing you insulation anomaly as a function of month for both the 6KA and 9KA. And you can see that depending on what time period you are, um, they, uh, the, the nature of solar anomaly compared to present day was different. And you need to be able to model this thing very accurately in a climate model to, to um, make a faithful uh, reconstruction of the climate in the past. Uh, fortunately, uh, orbital anomalies are the easiest part to model. Uh, it's usually the, the geographical changes that are very hard to model. So this is something just to, I'm showing you to keep in mind, um, to set the stage for the different kinds of changes that have been taking place in the Holocene over the last, uh, uh, or throughout the Holocene essentially. Uh, so now I'm going to pivot to uh, specifically the um, uh, phenomena of Green Sahara, which is um, um, which is very important to Crane because um, back in the because during the early Holocene and the mid Holocene, the Sahara was very different from present day, and that had a, a, a sort of associated effect in the Mediterranean region, in the Levant, and in the in throughout through to, to, to Mesopotamia as well. Um, and so we need to be able to model this very significant change into the climate system so that we can um, we can capture the associated impact in the Levant and the Mesopotamia, which is which are the areas of interest to Crane. Uh, so Sahara looks like this today, um, but uh, we, there is significant evidence that during the early Holocene and the mid Holocene, Sahara was much greener than this. And uh, this evidence comes from many lines, such as vegetation reconstruction, Paleo Lake reconstruction, um, desiccated river valleys that you can see from satellite images, um, Eolian deposits and sedimentary cores in the Atlantic, so over here off the coast of Morocco, uh, leaf fax deposits in sedimentary cores in the, uh, in the same Atlantic course. Uh, cave paintings depicting lush, lush landscape, archaeological findings supporting human habitation in various parts of Africa. So through all of these uh, evidences, we know that the Sahara was much greener. So there was a, an, a, an encroachment of uh, plant further north up, uh, plant and uh, animal, uh, animal life as well further north up, um, that really reached its peak during the early Holocene, but it was still very much um, um, uh, uh, active, and it was very, still very, very strong during the mid Holocene. Um, and we have evidence uh, going back to the past eight million years for several such phases of Green Sahara from uh, Sapropels in the Mediterranean. So uh, there's evidence actually of over 230 Green Sahara periods over the eight million year uh, interval, uh, as Lara Soana et al. have uh, compiled. Um, there's a lot of discussion over the nature of these uh, Green Sahara periods and whether they, they started and, and shut down abruptly. And this comes from um, dust records that have been captured here off the coast of uh, uh, Africa in the Atlantic. And I'm going to briefly show you here, this is basically terrigenous dust flux. So when you have Green Sahara, the dust flux is very low. And when you have a desert conditions, the dust flux is high. So right now there's a high dust flux. But if you go back to um, to the green, uh, uh, sorry, over here, the, there is dust flux very high, but you see around 5,000 years ago, there was a very abrupt transition from low dust flux to high dust flux. And this low dust flux period corresponding from 5,000 years to something about uh, 15,000 years is the Green Sahara period, where there is enough vegetation to prevent um, uh, a lot of dust being uh, kicked up by the winds. But then there is a very sudden transition. So this is a very interesting question for um, paleoclimatologists and for Crane, whether the um, interval, whether we have a, a, a very um, um, a rapid transition or a slow transition. I'm realizing that I'm actually uh, going slower than I expected. So I'm going to actually go forward to my results actually now. Uh, so here I'm showing you climate modeling results from a global model which does not include Green Sahara. And you can see, I will show you quickly only some results that over Africa in, pres um, in, in the precipitation anomaly with respect to present day, we have some uh, 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 enrichment of uh, increasing precipitation, but we're not able to capture all the 
all the precipitation increase that is shown by these proxies. You can see these green dots are proxies. But when I include a green Sahara land surface, so I have actually physically added a green Sahara land surface. And this is part of our paper recently to show that the when you change these uh, uh, land surface properties, uh, you actually get a much improved reconstruction, uh, I'm sorry, uh, agreement with uh, proxy reconstructions. Then you can see that the precipitation greatly increases and you can see this kind of precipitation can definitely sustain the Green Sahara. And now we are able to actually match the uh, proxy reconstructions much better. And I'm not gonna go into the details of that um, right now. And this is a temperature anomaly as well. And you can see there is a much more, um, there's a very interesting temperature pattern, like you have different temperature temperature over all these parts of Northern Africa and over Central Africa, you have a cooling because of the increased precipitation. Um, one thing I would point out is that uh, we are making changes only over Africa, only over Africa here, but you have um, far off changes over, let's say for example, here in, in, in Northern Europe and in, um, over Arctic as well. So there's some teleconnection that is happening between the Green Sahara changes and in, in Northern Hemisphere. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about teleconnections in just a moment. If I do the same and I study for early Holocene, actually, I'm going to skip over this one, which is 9K. Again, you can see that simply uh, if I don't put any kind of Green Sahara manually, then we do get a precipitation enhancement, but it is not it is not significant. It's, it's it's some enhancement because of the changes in the orbital orbital conditions, but it is not as much as one would one would get if I were to add a green Sahara condition here. And in this case, I've actually added a more uh, early Holocene specific green Sahara, so it's actually greener than the mid Holocene green Sahara. And so the results are somewhat different. So it's actually more precipitation. In, interestingly, there is actually more precipitation in the uh, along the in Mesopotamia and along the, um, the eastern um, um, uh, eastern Africa uh, and eastern Sahara and Arabia than over western uh, uh, Sahara. So this is a result that I'm currently um, uh, currently assessing more. Again, there is a lot of warming over the northern hemisphere because of telecon interesting teleconnection effects that that are subdued when green Sahara, as you, as I show here, is not included. Um, Anyways, I'm going to quickly move to um, our effort with dynamical downscaling. So as I had mentioned before, we are using global climate model, which has a very coarse resolution. And I'm showing you over here in this part of the world, the global climate grid, uh, which is actually a 100 kilometer resolution grid. And uh, to be able to provide very site specific information to Crane's uh, modeling efforts, uh, we are using a method called dynamical downscaling which uses global model uh, results to force a high resolution, which is shown here in this, you can see this embedded grid, a high resolution climate model, which is called WARF, which currently is operating at 30 kilometer resolution. And we, we, we are planning to downscale it further to 10 kilometer resolution. But you can already see from this graphic that going from 10, uh, from a 30 to uh, 100 kilometer resolution grid, to 30 kilometer resolution grid is a significant improvement and uh, is a significantly high resolution. And uh, the effect of going to high resolution is uh, there's there are numerous effects, but basically one of the things as is shown in this graphic from IPCC here is that when you go from high resolution to lower, uh, low resolution to high resolution, you're able to resolve the various topographical features such as the mountain ranges and coastlines much better than you can in a high resolution down grid. So this is approximately like this is 180 kilometers. So um, this is this is actually 110 kilometers. So this is our this is actually the resolution of a climate model, let, let the global climate model. But if we go to 30 kilometer resolution, that's even better. That's like a magnet. There's a factor of three better than this one. And so this is the reason why we want to go to dynamical downscaling because there is a lot of topography differences um, in in uh, topography uh, factors in this region that we want to be able to really capture quite accurately. So. In, in, by doing this, what we get for the crane region is shown in this figure here. So these are various crane specific sites and other historical sites that I've plotted here. And, um, uh, and, and this graphic here, there is the 
uh, this is square. So actually the climate model uh, grids, the, the exact climate model grids that would be covering this region. And you can see that some places we are not able to distinguish uh, uh, various sites from one another. They all, uh, you only get one climate information for two sites that, that might have totally different uh, archeological uh, importance and, and, uh, and, uh, and factors. And there are lots of mountain ranges here as well, and that we need we are not able to resolve with the climate uh, with the global resolution. But when we go to the local climate, the high resolution climate model, then we are actually able to tell these sites apart individually, and we are able to get an in a different uh, climate data for each of these sites. And that is that is really the advantage to the um, to the climate modeling um, to the cranes uh, aging based modeling effort. Um, so we have done a huge number of simulations with this uh, re high resolution climate model. And uh, the idea, the reason we are doing that is to actually choose a set of configura a configuration that works very good for the region. And this is something that I want to, this is a key takeaway I want people to take from here because is because um, depending on how because because climate models have a lot of parameterizations, it's not it's not all just um, it's not, it's not all very deterministic. The way you model your land surface, the way you model the clouds, um, and uh, and uh, and various other uh, important physics parameters, really makes a difference in the climate that you get. And we have like something like 20, 20 uh, yes, uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, I will be finishing very soon. Um, so, uh, we have something like 20 simulations and I'm showing you how the model climate can differ very much between them. Um, uh, the model climate differs very much between them depending on uh, what kind of parameterization that we have chosen. So all, so all climate models will have biases. So you will never get a perfectly good uh, climate model. And, but it's important to recognize what modeling choices that you have made and how they lead to um, the model that you get for your study reason. So for, uh, for both of these, for example, do pretty good. There's no anomaly over the um, Mediterranean region, but if you're trying to study like Italy or, or say um, as parts of Southern Europe, then depending, then the two of these have, have different biases and we would have to choose perhaps this one uh, because that has lower bias compared to this one here. Um, but yeah, this is a very much simplification of the whole thing, but I'm running out of time right now. We're also doing some work where you're including the uh, high resolution ocean model in this one, but I'm gonna skip over that. Finally, I'm going to just uh, finish off with uh, a paper that is submitted in, um, in uh, Climate of the Past with uh, Yiling Hu, who's an undergraduate student, who's a graduate student in our group, uh, where we apply the dynamical downscaling um, framework or, or to, um, to the um, uh, study of East uh, Asian monsoons, and this really brings up the uh, the importance and the and the uh, and the and the merit that and and the, and the value that you get from going to dynamic downscaling method. Again, we have included this kind of high resolution grid in climate in the in the atmosphere and the ocean, and the key result to take away from there is. Um, the two actually key results to take away. One of them is the, the influence of teleconnection. So I mentioned earlier about teleconnection to Northern Hemisphere when we impose Green Sahara, but what might be more important to researchers actually is the teleconnection to uh, various parts of Asia that come in when you include Green Sahara. So this is a mid Holocene simulation of this uh, where there's no Green Sahara. And you can see that this looks very different, especially over China. And, and, Asia, and, and India to a green Sahara, to a simulation of the mid Holocene that has green Sahara. So now you see that because we have good green Sahara, which is in, over Africa, but you can see there's a distinct climate model. There's a distinct difference in the similar climate for this region compared to one where you do not have green Sahara. And so this is something that is very important for researchers to keep in mind. Uh, something that you do in one part of the world can have significant difference in another part of the world. And um, so you can see here that now, just because we put Green Sahara, we are actually able to agree with the, these, these uh, precipitation proxies that show greater precipitation uh, 
we actually able to agree with that now and we were not able to do that before and this is only in the global model when you go to the high resolution downscale model mm -hmm. then we are able to actually do much better over here in the mountain ranges where these first precipitation proxies are are concentrated and we're able to really um uh, do a better job than actually the global model here okay do so yeah so i have my summary slide here yeah <laughs> sorry i'm going a bit over time we do yeah. have a few so, questions that i want to be able to ask you as well so if you, if you can be very very briefly summarize and then we'll go to the questions please awesome okay um so uh just to summarize i um, it's important to um to model the past with very high fidelity and it and, and for that purpose it's important to be very mindful of the boundary conditions that you're using in a climate model um it's important to know the limitations of one's modeling choices. So um, it's sometimes necessary to test multiple configurations to find out the model that works best for your region, especially important for high resolution local modeling, which is very parameter parameter param, uh, par parameter heavy. Uh, Teleconnections is important. So for researchers that are working in different parts of the world, they might be very interested to know about the teleconnections that come from Green Sahara, especially to teleconnections to Asia and South America. For the Crane project, we have exhaustively studied the effects of Green Sahara on the local climate at different times in Holocene. This will help us design the full transient Holocene experiment. We have performed several experiments um, with our high resolution model to find a configuration that is best suited to Crane's uh, region of study. And we're making good progress there and we should have uh, some mid Holocene results very soon. And high resolution modeling, uh, the ability of high resolution model um, is already shining um, with regards to the study of uh, East Asian monsoon. So hopefully we'll be um, using it uh, quite, quite well in the, in the Korean interval as well. Okay, thank Sorry, you very much. <laughs> thank you very much, Deepak. I think if, if, if uh, I just want to say very quickly that um, building off of Sandy, Harrison's presentation a keynote yesterday that the plea for collaborations between uh, climate science and environmental science, with environmental science and archaeology, I think we're really moving into that uh, kind of a, a situation here with the results of your uh, ongoing uh, building of this RCM that we're really very close now to beginning, I think, to be able to start trying to make those kind of connections. So I have a number of quick questions. And if there's any way you can answer these quickly, I think we have a okay. few minutes. Um, the first one is, uh, did you not implement the relic ice shield in Quebec in your 6KA experiment? And then maybe if I can just add a second one to that to try and see if you can get them um, both answered quickly. The second is about vegetation cover. Did you implement your green Sahara experiment yet? Uh, yes. So. Um just about the ice sheet uh, let me just go back here so there was there were probably some very small ice sheets in 6k so uh, for an approximation i did not include that there uh, in 9ka there were there was more expensive ice sheets so that is included but for 6k um the the uh, the relics were very very small and so for the purposes of um uh, ease of reconstruction i did not do that uh it's not expected to actually the, given the size of the relics it's not expected to have any kind of significant impact at 6k uh, the green sahara simulation i did model that uh, maybe i did not come across that um so this one when i was showing the sequence of slides this is the one without green sahara and this is the one with green sahara so this is mid holocene with green sahara and this is without green sahara so you can see without green sahara the temperature and uh, precipitation um, results are very different from the ones that are obtained uh, when green sahara is included and there's similar there's a there's an early holocene this is without green sahara early holocene and this is green sahara with the early holocene Okay, um, one more a two part question and then we'll move to our next presentation. And this is uh, regarding the downscaling. How do you choose which model is optimal? And is it from the uncertainties derived from the model or from empirical comparison with data from natural archives or some other approach? Absolutely, good question. So what I was trying to show here from this figure, uh, I should have mentioned this slide, this line here, is the performance of selected ensemble members for present day. So uh, we are uh, we're taking, them, uh, we are, these are actually runs performed for the present day. There is no mid Holocene here. And this is basically a, a, nine, a 1980 uh, to 1990 or something run. Uh, and we are comparing that to observational data set for the present day. So we are comparing it to see how this model for the present day is performing with data so in the present day these these models are performing relatively well here there is some dry bias 
Whereas these models are actually sort of like they, they have so much red bias, they might as well have been uh, Green Sahara on its own in the present day. So if a model does not work very good for the present day, then if it has too much bias, then we're obviously not going to apply it for the mid Holocene. Very good. Thank you very much, Deepak. So this is, I think, really, really Thank exciting. You. And I think we can expect a lot, lot more exciting uh, results uh, to be reported on in the in the future sessions of this conference and in other places. And hopefully they'll also show the beginning of the connection uh, between the collaboration with uh, from the archaeological side. Um, I'd like uh, and I apologize also because of my flustered nature at the beginning of all this not to have introduced you and your uh, talk. But thank you so much, Deepak. I saw it. <laughs> thank you, Tim. Yeah. See you.